There's two very important technologies that Linux brings to the table. One of those is plain old messaging and message passing, and the other one is Dbus. Without those two things, nothing in Linux would ever work. When Unix was being formed in the earliest days, they needed a mechanism for passing messages from one application to another. That earliest form of message passing was incorporated into what Unix called pipes and filters. Well, pipes and filters are used in Linux today. It's still there. And how did they develop it? They used something called interprocess communication or IPC. And IPC is basically a, a mechanism by which I can pass messages or data from one application or user to another application or user. And there was also, there was uh, later on, uh, IPC originally had to have a separate area of memory for each application, but later on they added the ability to do shared memory so that one or more applications could use the same block of memory to pass messages. That way, all of them could see it. They all could see the messages that were going back and forth. There's uh, also two types of message passing that you can do. The first type was synchronous. And synchronous means I send a message and then I need to wait for a response that comes back from the thing I sent it to. So I can't do anything else until I'm sort of blocked up waiting for a message to come back. The other kind is asynchronous, which says I can. it's fire and forget. I send the message and I'll come back and check on it later to see if it was received or not. And, but I'm not going to sit there and wait for it. I'm going to go do something else while that processing takes place. Because there, you can have long-running transactions that could tie up your front-end application and prevent it from doing any useful work. Asynchronous was, was created in order basically to allow for high-performance communications without incurring a high overhead. Um, the other thing that was needed was we needed a math mechanism to lock that area of memory that was being shared in order to prevent one application from updating at the same time another application was trying to do the same thing. That could result in incorrect data being passed to all the listeners that are waiting for that message to come about. One of the other things that was um, implemented as a result of this was the ability to stream video and audio over the uh, over the network. So without that message passing, without message passing, that would not work. What's an example? Tell me an example of message passing. So let's say that. I have a USB device that I'm gonna plug into my Linux machine. When I do that, there's a message that's sent to trigger from the device driver to the Linux kernel to say, hey, you got a new device that's here, and Linux will then, will then it'll either prompt you and say, hey, you got, you got a drive, a disk drive that was connected, or a, or a uh, USB stick, or something, that's been, or a printer, whatever, scanner, that's been connected to the system and it's letting you know that it's available to you. The other thing is that the system can also communicate with you if, for example, you have a device like a printer that runs out of paper, it needs to tell you about it. And so that's another way that allows you to be notified as well. So that's another useful thing. Problem with interprocess communication or IPC was that in its original form, it was very complex and very inefficient. Well, why is that? Well, in the early days of IPC, there wasn't any service to manage it. There was kind of, uh, because most of the systems didn't have a whole lot of applications running on it. I remember, you know, if you, if you had, you know, a couple of dozen or maybe even a dozen applications running, you probably were using all the memory on the machines back then. So, but each application had to open a communication channel to the applications that it wanted to communicate to. So say you had three applications running and one of them needed to communicate to the other two, that one would have to create two, uh, two messaging paths, one for each application. And they in turn, if they wanted to communicate with you, they had to create uh, a communication channel back. Yeah, it's just, it, 
it's fine for when things are small, but when it's when you start scaling up to thousands of applications and thousands of users, well, all of a sudden it's yeah, it, it's starting to look like a scribble diagram, if you know what I mean by a scribble diagram. So yeah, if you try to diagram that out, all you end up with is lines all over the paper, and you can't see anything else. So Dbus was invented to try to deal with that. But Dbus was trying to deal with two other things at the same time. The, the Gnome project had started to use Corba as its mechanism to handle messages. Well, Corba is, is, is a cannon to kill an ant. I mean, it, it is a very heavyweight application. And then KDE used something called DCOP. You already had this divergence between different desktop environments that were diverging from the IPC standard and going off on their own and developing completely different things. So Dbus came about in order to try to standardize that and make it more simple and, and allow those two services, GNOME and KDE, to go off and, and stop concentrating on communication stuff and let the system do that for them. Dbus has, has two buses that are built into it. The first is the system bus. The system bus is created every time a user logs onto the system. So for each user session, you'll have your own unique uh, area of control for the Dbus. That helps it identify you so that when you're sending messages, Dbus, the service, knows who to send it back to. That provides the, the ability for services to communicate with users. It allows applications to communicate with users or to the system. And that, of course, allowed for integration for the desktop session as well. So things like plugging a mouse in would inform you on the screen. When your Wi-Fi connected, it would inform you on the screen. When it disconnected, it would inform you on the screen. So that now Dbus is very important for today uh, in, because it is central to the way Linux works. There's also a session bus that's also created for each user. And that provides desktop services to the same user applications in the same session. It's just at a different level. And rather than, rather than it going all the way up to the kernel, it allows that control to stay down in the user session so that my user session can communicate with other applications that I'm running in that session. But... I cannot communicate with another user through that. I have to use a system bus. The D bus, what is, how does it work? Well, I have applications that are connected to a service, and that service is the Dbus daemon. So basically, you're sending messages just to the Dbus daemon, and that daemon is in turn passing it on to other applications or to the kernel, and, and, and then receiving messages from the kernel or those applications and sending, routing them back to you. So, yeah, I remember there was a, was, this is a while back, but uh, Bell Labs was working on something called the, yeah, the Universal Application Translator. Basically, what it was designed to do was I could send any formatted data into it. I told it what the format was, and then I told it what the format I wanted out. So I, I would pass this in, it would take it, convert it, send and pipe, and send it back out on a pipe. So... Yeah, that allowed that completely removed a lot of the complexity in applications code because now I had a messaging system that I could say, oh, I want to translate the spreadsheet format over to a CSV. I want to translate this graphics uh, format, and say it's GIF or JPEG, over to PNG, for example. So it was pretty nice about that. You, you could you could also you know you could also convert it to nonsensical ones as well, but it, it probably would say something like, I don't know what you want me to do because I don't have a translator for that. But uh, yeah, so Dbus, just to summarize, applications can use the Dbus protocols as well. So I can bypass the Dbus daemon. I don't have to use that. But I have the protocols that are already written, already debugged, and already working that I can just use, uh, and I can communicate directly with another application without going through the, the bus daemon. Why would I do that? Maybe I had really high performance uh, communication I wanted to perform, so I'm passing messages directly to that application to do it. Because when you're talking to the service, you're sending a message to the service. It, in turn, has to queue up a message to the destination. And then when the destination sends back, 
it sends it to the daemon. The daemon then has to queue up one to send it to reply back to you. So yeah, you can see it's a four hop affair, whereas going direct is a two. So that does make a difference in performance. And why would I use a Dbus protocol? Well, <laughs> the best kind of programming code that you can use is one you didn't write. <laughs> that's, that's, my, that's the way I always look at things. Uh, I guess probably the best way to look at this is to take a look at an example. So suppose you're listening to some music on your on your machine and a call comes in. Maybe it comes in through Skype, maybe it comes through through Zoom. But you go ahead and you answer it. There's a the Dbus could send a message out through the out through the system to any applications that are using audio and tell them, hey, turn down, I've got a call. And so they could turn down automatically without you having to go to each one and turn down the volume on those applications. And when the call is over, it would then restore the volume back to where it was set. So it would send them another message out that says, okay, it's all, all clear, go back to your norm, whatever the setting was previous. I hope, you, I hope you learned a little bit about some of the more powerful features. Now, this is not a, a lesson on how to use IPC, but I am going to show you uh, a bit of a demonstration on how it works and what it does. So what we're going to do here is just a, a simple experiment to uh, to see how this works. So first I'm going to do a, a bus monitor and just putting in some general parameters for TLD domain sub. And then I'll start up the receiver app. This is a Python script and it's designed to receive uh, a couple of protocols. And so the first one is the invoker. That runs three different uh, uh, protocols. First, it sends a message. It sends a failure. It catches that failure, and you can see that display, and then it exits. And then there's the emitter, and the emitter just sends one message and quits. So that's all it does. It sends a test signal and quits. And you can see on the monitor what's happening here. So that's basically how... Dbus work. With that, I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please like and subscribe. Hope to see you guys real soon. Bye for now.